There are those who believe that the world we know is not what it seems. That the devil is real. And that we are in the middle of an epic war he is waging against us. If you look at the world, there seems to be another force at work that has a will towards evil. When you are inside the exorcism, you are attacking. And the demon is defending himself. A battle between good and evil, fought man to man and soul to soul. If you are unlucky enough to be caught up in it, there are only a handful of people in the world who can help you. They are the exorcists, and these are their true stories. Once evil is turned out into the world, it is exceedingly difficult to put back in the box. Every year, the Roman Catholic Church receives thousands of requests for help with what the church calls demonic infestations. In fact, the church has had to set up the International Association of Exorcists to help educate priests about all things demonic. In 2004, they got a call about this house in Pittsburgh. The house infestation is, is a lot more prominent than people know these days or talk about. Because if you say that to somebody, I hear things or see things move, they're gonna say, oh yeah, you got a few screws loose in your head. The church decided to call in psychologist Adam Blay to interview the family that lived in the house. Adam is one of the few lay members of the International Association of Exorcists. Adam is a great gift, a very holy, talented man. He's a layman trained in psychology. He knows theology. He's a spiritual person who's not afraid of the evil one. Adam has participated in dozens of exorcisms, but realizes that dealing with skepticism is part of the job. I think it's completely rational and reasonable to think that possession and the reality of demons is medieval nonsense, as you say. Um, without a direct experience of something this extraordinary, I think it is natural and rational to conclude that it's not real. Adam got his first direct experience of the paranormal at Bob Cranmer's house, and the two men have since become friends. What we went through here and the priests that we worked with and my relationship with Adam specifically. Um, uh, you know, to meet with him again and for him to come here and, I, you know, there's, there's just a camaraderie that we have because I know that he knows um, what happened here. What happened there was what the Catholic Church calls a demonic infestation. Classically, there are three levels of demonic problem. Infestation, which is when a demon is active in a place or a space. Oppression, which it has now focused on a particular person. And possession, when that person has allowed that demon to take over their body. Infestation is the most common type of demonic problem that we respond to by far. Infestation is attacks and possession over material things, houses, and places. I've prayed in houses where people have heard things, things have moved, been cold, there are smells, there are footsteps. It's like these spirits own the house. And usually what happens is, serious demonic activity took place there, seances, satanic worship. Perhaps murders and crimes have occurred there. So evil one, like a glove, came over and possessed that place. This particular house had held Bob Cranmer spellbound since he was a child. I grew up in this area here, and from the time I was a, a young child, probably like in the early 1960s, uh, I was always fascinated with this house in particular. I was by it at all. I was intrigued by it. I, I wanted to know what went in on inside it. I wanted to know who the people were that, uh, that lived in it. What did they do? Bob was married with a family when he returned to Pittsburgh after a long absence and learned that his childhood dream house was on the market. So the first time I actually fulfilled my dream in coming into the house, 
uh, was to look at it to buy. We bought the house, we moved in, uh, we had four young children, uh, and uh, you know we settled in. All was well initially, and uh, we were probably here for about uh, probably six weeks into it. And my wife and I began to notice there was something not right with the house. Things would be moved, things would go missing. One area of the house seemed especially active, a cupboard under the stairs. There's a light in the closet and there's a pull chain on it. So when I would come home at night and open the closet, the pull chain would either be wrapped around the light or very meticulously wrapped around one of the little chains that holds the globe in place. So we conducted a little test. I said, okay, close the door. <laughs> Open the closet again, and sure enough, the chain would be. So we knew then, okay, we got a ghost. All the neighborhood kids that we met, they'd be like, oh, you live in that house. It's pretty spooky. And we're like, yeah, it's haunted. You know, they wouldn't believe us, and we'd invite them over for a night, and, you know, none of them would ever come back. It's very important to understand the difference between a human spirit haunting and a demonic haunting, which we would call an infestation. From a Catholic perspective, the human spirit haunting is a soul in purgatory, signaling that they're present. A demonic infestation is destructive. That seemed to describe what was happening in the Cranmer house. Um, Bob would wake up every morning with scratches, and it looked like um, a cat's nails had scratched him down his back. Um, two of my kids saw a dark shadow um, standing over their beds. In the shape of like a human, and it came just like hopping into my room, stood at the foot of my bed, and I just looked at it for a second. <clears throat> I pulled the blankets up over my head, flew out of my hands to the bottom of my feet, folded, Perfectly. As years went by, um, certain members of my family uh, began to have um, mental mental issues, oppressions, very very um, um, paranoid type behavior, completely out of context with who they were and who they are. It's Malik. He's my friend. I guess you could say went out of control, and. Uh, Got pretty crazy there for a couple years. I spent 14 days in psychiatric ward, locked down in psychiatric ward, um, because this thing was affecting me, and we didn't know that at the time. We thought it was just me. We weren't the same people. We were all completely different. Finally, 2002, 2003, the phenomenon in the house became very apparent, and kind of in your face. I mean, it was not masking its presence anymore. And what do you do? I mean, I was a Protestant at the time. I went to the pastor of, you know, the pastor of my church and told him about this. And his eyes got as big as, you know, 50 cent pieces and said, oh, okay, thanks, you know. You know, I've seen the movies, The Exorcist and so on. And, and well, what do you do? You talk to a priest. As an experienced priest, Father Mike Salvagna was familiar with demonic infestations and blessed the house many times in addition to celebrating mass there. There was two priests who would come to the house and then there was this kind of mysterious mystical priest who would only talk to me on the telephone. And he said he could not come to the house for whatever reason. He said that if, his, if he came to the house, things would get much worse. Experience has taught the exorcists that demons fight to retain what they've conquered. All right, why a demon would want to infest a house? Well, it's territorial. The demon wants to possess the earth, possess people, ultimately wants to kill them. So any way the evil one can wreck family life, he's gaining ground. A number of different priests came to bless the house, but when the prayer session seemed to have no effect, Adam Blay was called in. I got involved in the case as an outside observer brought in to just provide uh, kind of validating outside observation. And I guess they wanted a fresh set of eyes. 
What happened next would change Adam's life and put him in regular contact with dark forces. Forces he believes can only be described as demonic. After years of living in a house they believed was haunted, Bob Cranmer and his family called on Father Mike Salvagna and Adam Blay to see if they could rid the building of evil spirits. We would be protected. But that's easier said than done. Being involved in demonology, being involved in working with people that have become entangled with the demonic is complicated. At the beginning, you feel like a detective. You're trying to figure out what went on here, what is still hidden, what secrets are being kept. Father Mike and Adam went through the house, blessing every room. And so, Lord, we take our blessed water and blessed salt. Holy water is a very powerful sacramental of the church. We use it during exorcisms because it seems to cause demons pain and compelling them to obey commands. But instead of cooperating, the demons seemed to be fighting back. Blood began to run down the walls. Uh, began upstairs in the uh, stairway uh, to my right and progressively came down through the second floor to the first floor. And uh, you would actually see uh, what appeared to be uh, red blood that would be brown when it dried that would run down the walls. I have pictures of it. I also had it analyzed by a lab uh, as to what it was. And they, they really weren't sure what it was. That would happen a day or two after the house blessing. And in that, we throw holy water it was probably, the devil always reverses things, and so it's a way to show defilement. Their version is to throw blood on the walls. Within a week, things were worse than they'd been before the blessing. The phenomenon as they, as they took place uh, became more and more ominous. And uh, really, a lot of it was centered uh, in these two bedrooms. There was a, a time for probably about seven months where we vacated these rooms completely. We, no one slept in them because the entity really gravitated to these two rooms. And um, the entity which would, uh, would park itself here at night had a very, very strong localized um, stench, as I can call it. It was a combination of a burning rubber and a sulfur smell. I actually experienced that here too. And it was the first time I've ever experienced it. It's very eerie. It's like a packet of horrible odor that moves. Through him, with him, in him. More prayer sessions followed, but conditions in the Cranmer's home didn't improve. We were doing everything uh, that could be done. Um, from a religious standpoint, and, and it wasn't working. I mean, it was getting worse. Exorcism uh, is just not reading the prayers and like snap a finger and the person's gone. But we are talking about days, weeks, and maybe months of working with a person to try to get them free. And sometimes all you can achieve is what I call a truce. By now, Bob and his family were talking seriously about abandoning their home, but they didn't. Maybe it's just my character and my nature. Uh, I do really believe that, um, you know, there is good and there's evil. And uh, evil um, is powerful, but good can prevail uh, in the long run. And uh, this is my house. This has always been, you know, the house that I wanted since I was a child. And I wasn't going to give it up to anything or anybody. It was during these difficult times that Adam paid one of his many visits to the house. He sensed the presence of evil more strongly than ever before. I experienced smelling a horrific, disembodied odor of death and something rotting moving through the home. I was scratched across the head by nothing. The strange thing about these was that about 90 seconds later, they had completely disappeared. As he was getting ready to leave, Adam paused by the front stairs, his attention drawn to the cupboard with its quirky light bulb chain. I had a strange and strong feeling that there was something under the stairs behind the closet. It was a, a large space under the steps that you could almost stand up in. It had been sealed for almost 100 years. Uh, there was no access into it at all from the floor, from the side. Adam suggested they break through the wall. And what they found there mystified them. We found my son's Lego toys 
in this area. How that stuff would ever have gotten in there, there was no cracks, there was no way some, but there was a whole number of things that they found that were clearly possessions of people that had lived in this house. One of the items was a crumpled drawing. It showed a house and a family on one side. What is this? I have no idea. On the other side was a crude drawing of a demonic figure and a name, Moloch, a demonic figure associated with child sacrifice in the Old Testament. Doesn't mean the paper was a curse or was necessarily connected with black magic, but it seemed to be some, perhaps a clue. For Adam and Father Mike, having a name for the demon gave them a significant advantage, if the name was the right one. Now, the demons, of course, know this. They will fight tooth and nail not to give their true name, because once the priest has that name, it's no longer in the name of God, get out. It's in the name of God, blankety blank, get out. And that prayer, because it's specific, has a much greater impact. But why had the demons chosen to infest the house in the first place? The problems are there because the previous person who had authority over the home did something to invite the devil into that space. What was it? Neighborhood gossip from the 1930s suggested an answer. The research seemed to indicate that there could have been illegal abortions performed in the building by a doctor who had run his office down the street. Armed with a name and a possible reason for the infestation, Special prayer services were conducted in the house. Oh God, who in every place subject to thee are present as guardian, this petition may deserve the shelter. This house may never slacken. Moloch was called out and told to leave. But if the demons were listening, they gave no sign. Because what happened next was... Amen. Nothing. You would think, if this was a movie, you know, that there would be some great dramatic ending to it. Um, it was more like a, a blazing fire that burned itself out. And uh, the embers lasted for a time, and then they went out as well. It was like a switch turned off, and everybody went back to normal. Seven years later, Adam is encouraged by what he sees and feels. I have to say it feels completely peaceful to me. I don't feel any hint of warning bells or a sense of any background presence or anything even lingering. Everything feels just good. I, I can honestly say uh, that, uh, you know, the peace and tranquility uh, that is in this house today is, is genuine. I think it's long standing, and I can only go back and compare it to what it was like during and before uh, the battle, so to speak. But exorcists tell us that diabolical infestations are more common than we think. I'm here in Los Angeles to visit my friend Andy Kopic, an MIT trained physicist who purchased a factory some years ago that's very haunted. And today, he has had me come out to the building and try to calm the haunting down or clear it out of there. Andy's company makes lasers and other high-tech equipment. My background is in general physics, applied physics, thermodynamic physics, uh, mathematics. I started this company in a small little building and I ran out of room. So we expanded and, and moved into this building. The former tenants, they showed up to pick up some mail that was delivered. They didn't have it forwarded at that point. The fellow walks in and he asks me, um, how's the building working out for you? And he was actually nervous when he walked into the lobby. And I said, what do you mean, how's the building working out for me? I said, it's, it's great. And he says, you're, you're not here at night, are you? Yeah, sometime. He says, don't you hear the pounding and the screams and the, the noises? And he said, that's why we moved. <laughs> and I, I thought, you've got to be kidding. But I wondered what it sounded like here at night. I wondered what, what sounds they were hearing. And it's a big industrial park. I mean, of course you're going to have sounds. There's trucks moving in and out and people rummaging around through the dumpster, maybe, or... So I put some recorders out here in the shop. Hello. 
after reviewing some of the audio, I, I didn't think about a haunting. I thought someone was getting into the building. It was very noisy, and it sounded as though it, were, it was all coming from inside of this room. Andy changed all the locks, but when the sound still didn't stop, he decided to install security cameras to catch the intruders on tape. Instead, the cameras picked up something totally unexpected. The security cameras were picking up motion in different parts of the building, and no one was in here. Things were moving. Things were physically moving and making sounds. I was fascinated. Oh my gosh, I'm really seeing things that are, that are moving. This is, this is quantum physics candy. Andy's next step was to design and install some more sophisticated sensing equipment. My security cameras weren't picking up some of the things. I could see, I could see objects moving, but I couldn't see what was moving them. So built some special cameras uh, that can image down into the shorter wavelengths of light, things that we necessarily can't see. There were endless hours of footage where nothing happened. But every so often, the ultraviolet camera would pick up something. And at the same time, objects moved. Now we start doing this investigation and, oh my gosh, here is an enormous, um, an enormous manifestation of energy that I can see on the camera. We're actually measuring these energies. We're seeing these things happen and it's not just someone saying, I, I have a weird feeling. Andy started researching the paranormal and attended a conference where he met Adam Blay, who agreed to pay the factory a visit. Can you play that again? Now, when you did video, I think the one time you told me a partition fell. Can, can we look at that? Absolutely. Nobody's there? Nobody's in your building? No, it, it's completely locked up. And that part's clearly destructive. And that wall you added, right? When you got here? Yes, yes. Interesting little side story. That's the same area that the previous tenant had problems with. Yeah, I never put this together until now that there seems to be a localization because what I've noticed with some hauntings is they seem to be almost tethered, like in a 20-foot radius circle. <laughs> and this is often seems to be with human souls, particularly bad people that we think are in purgatory and are working out their spiritual baggage, but they don't seem to be allowed to move very far. And it's dawning on me as we're looking at this that that's all within a 20-foot radius, 40-foot diameter area. Mm -hmm. It might fit that pattern. Two historical incidents suggested that the factory might merely be haunted and not infested. There's a, there was a oil refinery across the street that had a traumatic accident and fire that uh, kind of leveled the place, and there were a few people that were killed within that event. And also on the land, um, surrounding here, there have been um, some mass graves that were uncovered when they were excavating the, the land to, to get the, uh, you know, the classic Indian burial ground explanation for, for what was going on. For souls in purgatory, the church recommends prayers and blessings. And holy is this door. If they proceed without resistance, it's less likely that demonic forces are involved. I basically said some prayers asking for a blessing for the building and uh, the blessing of the threshold, which is an old Catholic blessing for a doorway, to ask angels to guard it, that evil not be able to cross that threshold. It's a very powerful blessing. Amen. No one knows what was causing the disturbances in the factory, but they seem to stop after the blessing. And now Andy's been left with more questions than answers. It changes everything. It changes how you look at everything. At that point, I was forced to challenge everything that I know because there are new realities that are, that are measurable. Whatever those new realities are, 
Humans have been trying to tap into them for centuries, and the church believes that's a very bad idea. All across the country, interest in the paranormal is on the rise, and it's keeping Adam busy. Sometimes I'm on the road 90% of the month. I'm continuously being summoned, so I'll jump on a plane. I'll land in some city. Somebody will take me to a hotel or a rectory and then take the ride over to some exorcism, deal with some demon. Right now I'm in the Midwest, I'm heading to check in with Misty, uh, a woman I've been working with for about five years. Like many people that have gotten involved in the occult in the form of the paranormal, she has developed a problem. What's present right now is a real evil spirit, and it's in this room as we're talking, and it's angry. The demons use many tricks, and one of them is through spirit communication, divination, in order to lure people into a relationship with them. In Misty's case, her free will choices to open the door to spirits through divination is what led to her problems. The more we engage our free will to consent to evil or to the suggestions and insinuations of the devil, uh, for example, by a pact with the devil, satanic rituals, dabbling in the occult even, it opens the door. I went on my first paranormal investigation and I saw somebody doing dousing rods and I was immediately drawn to it, just beeline. For Misty, the door opened with dowsing, the ability to sense energy fields using metal rods. I started using them in ways probably most people don't use them. Um, I was able to help other investigators locate where the spirits are, ask them to come up and communicate with me first if they were stubborn. It was captivating. It just kind of pulled me in, and it, it pulled me in very quickly. I was always under the understanding, if you're doing it for the right reasons, and if you keep yourself grounded, and you pray to God, and you ask for protection, that you're going to be safe. And that's not true. It's not true. Misty had grown up in a Christian household and believed that guardian angels were always nearby to protect her. Now, she wasn't so sure. At some point in the process, I started to feel that I was being governed by something that was not positive. In the beginning, it was a lot of the poltergeist type activity. There would be the sound of breaking glass. It sounded like every glass in my house broke. I'd go to investigate. There wouldn't be any glass. What went from curiosity and wanting to do the right thing became an obsession. There was just a seduction to it that just pulled me along. One particular night, I saw something in the window, and I thought somebody was standing on the other side of the window watching me. Who's there? But when it ran, the entity ran behind me and through my house. At that point, everything escalated. I started smelling the smell of death. I'm looking at the ceiling, and all of a sudden, this horrible-looking demonic thing flies out of the ceiling towards me and grabs a hold of me, and my arms are pinned and I'm struggling. I felt like I was being held underwater. It was horrible. That's when I called Adam. When we work with people, we often give them sacramentals, which are essentially blessed objects, blessed by a priest. In Misty's case, one of the objects that I had given her to use was a blessed candle. I simply instructed her to light the candle uh, if she was going to be praying, and also to light it if she felt that there were evil spirits nearby. Good to see you. Nice to see you again. You feeling okay? I can feel that there is something that keeps popping in. There is still something there. I certainly feel a physical difference. Does it feel like the same kind of things that communicated with you over the years? <laughs> yeah, does... yeah, it, it does. The thing that has occurred that, that makes me think that there's something going on is the time that I did the candle. What was it that you did when you used it? I laid down, lit the candle, 
and it became apparent that something did come into the room. I asked the holy angels to please come into me and fill me with their inspiration and guidance. As soon as I said that, I felt that same energy that one time I was when I was really attacked, right. I felt that same energy zip up through my feet and it was so quick it, it didn't waste any time. As he listened to the details, Adam realized Misty had made a common mistake. Bless candles, uh, they're sacramentals, you know, they're holy things. Unfortunately, it's, it's a false assumption that evil spirits can't be around when there's something holy present. And the thing about good spirits, there's never a need to invite them to actually enter your body. I, I had a bad feeling as soon as it happened. I'm still quite surprised I'm even in this position and situation. What do you mean? I, it's, it's just <clears throat> so bizarre mm -hmm. to think that, you know, someone who's normal and doesn't worship the devil and do all that stuff mm -hmm. can end up in this situation. Mm -hmm. It's really scary. My inclination would be that we do two steps, and that is to renounce the right that it was given, and then we'll pray a little bit and ask God to remove it. Does that sound? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Once human evil is released, once evil is turned out into the world, it is exceedingly difficult to put back in the box. Misty, do you renounce any ties to the devil established through the occult? Yes. Do you renounce any ties to the devil established through divination? Yes. Through communicating with spirits in any way? Yes. Lord Jesus Christ, please break all rights the devil has to Misty based on these things and any others that we may be unaware of. I've been given permission by the church and the exorcists that have trained me to say prayers for people and to ask God to bless them. Keep us faithful to our Lord Jesus Christ forever and ever. Amen. Amen. All right, so we'll be in touch, okay? Okay, thank you again, Adam. All right. When Misty had lit the candle, she explicitly gave the spirits that she felt present permission to enter her body. This, of course, was a mistake. I think Misty is doing much better, but these things don't end instantly all in one session. As with most people, it's a process of disentangling yourself from the demonic and from the deceptions that you've been lured into. Misty became a target for demons when she showed an intense curiosity for divination and dowsing. But the church teaches that all interest in the paranormal can be dangerous, because you never know what you might bring home. Get the camera and the EVP on. From experience, the church teaches that when demonic forces are present, they are always trying to draw us into conversation. And the church has a simple rule for protection. Don't speak to the demon. Uh, in a sense, that is probably the biggest of the rules. To speak to a demon is to flirt with being lured into a relationship with a demon. And this is why spirit communication is so dangerous. Penny Willis was a member of a group of ghost hunters in upstate New York. We went on a tour of, of a haunted place, a known haunted place, you know, a bunch of us went. There's something more to us, and it is that inner yearning for something else that is where our interaction with the spiritual world begins. So somebody says, I want to go do ghost hunting. I want to go look for the stuff. They want to experience it. They want to be connected to it. And sometimes that connection goes in directions that they don't want it to go in. Penny frequently spent time at her daughter's house, babysitting her grandson, Seth, who is autistic. But it was Penny's daughter, Elizabeth, who was the first to feel that an invisible presence was playing with her. Had her mother brought an evil spirit home with her? The grandmother of the child was pretty seriously involved in ghost hunting and had been trying to record evidence of spirits at a cemetery and seemed to have caught a black shadow on film. And this whole problem started, I believe, the night or the day after uh, the child's mother visited the grandmother's house and watched this footage with her. I believe there's a very big possibility that it could have been attached to her and just followed her here. Whatever it was, it seemed to take an interest in Seth 
or his bedroom. Then we'd hear growling. The growling would come from my son's room. <laughs> I couldn't deal with that. I was scared. I remember one time she called me that uh, she complained that her computer room was right off of Seth's bedroom and that his bedroom door, which was at the computer, had slammed shut. And so she was panicking. And I'm on the phone with her, and I said, well, open the door. She said, well, I did open the door. And all of a sudden, I heard a loud bang, and the slam shut. The door to Seth's bedroom opened and closed on its own, even after Elizabeth put a rug under it. <laughs> Seth's behavior began to change. He would be afraid. He'd wake up around 3 o'clock every morning screaming for no reason at all. He would see something that I didn't see. And, you know, at first we thought maybe he was just having nightmares, maybe night terrors at his age. Many people wake up at around 3 a.m. at the end of a four-hour sleep cycle. But in some cases, the time can be significant. 3 p.m. in the afternoon is a traditional time when Jesus Christ died on the cross. 3 a.m. is the complete opposite of that. Again, this pattern of the devil mocking God and doing the inversion of things. Before the trouble began, Seth was a cheerful child with a sunny disposition. It, it was really awful because Seth has always been, it's hard to explain, but everything makes him happy. The simplest things make him happy. Nothing made him cry, you know? You would have no way of knowing what's going on with him, that if he's crying, there's something bad going on. We took him to doctors, we took him to specialists. Nothing was wrong with him. Outside of the home, Seth seemed to be his usual happy self. Take him for rides. Uh, we'd pull back in the driveway. The second we pulled in the driveway, he'd start shaking and screaming. He was serious. He literally cried from the moment he walked in the door until he finally would just pass out because he was, I mean, you know, he was so tired and exhausted. And that was every day, every day, <laughs> all the time. The child seemed to be seeing something that was absolutely terrifying into him. And he would very specifically point at something which he had never done before. The interesting thing about this is that an autistic child, in a sense, can't lie. They don't play games with deception and hiding things and, and pretending how they feel. But it wasn't only Seth who was being tormented. Oh, wake up, I'm home. What is that? Penny awoke one day feeling as if she'd been clawed while she slept. Did you scratch yourself? No. You're bleeding. I had deep scratches, three of them, coming up across my face. I had no clue, no clue how they got there. Three straight lines? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That is very typical. We actually see that a lot um, with demonic hauntings. For some reason, they like to scratch in threes. We think it's in relation to the Trinity, because they do things in threes a lot. When my mom got scratched, I was scared to death. Um, I was under the impression for a long time that uh, any kind of entity or ghost or spirit or whatever you want to call it could not physically hurt you. Of course, I wanted to write it off as maybe she scratched herself in her sleep. Nothing happened. The church has a name for this type of demonic harassment. It's called oppression. A demon has gained rights to be present in that place. Now, that demon wants you, and it'll run any con on you that you'll open the door to. It will then push for more and more control, more interaction, and the moment that you say, no, I don't want to do what you say anymore, it'll turn on you and bite you. And that's usually when we get called. Oftentimes, people have already been experiencing a great deal of trial, turmoil, distress, and chaos before they come to us. You know, oftentimes, they'll try to handle it themselves, cope with it themselves, go to other friends, perhaps, perhaps even a psychologist. The church is always required to the best of the culture and science of the times to rule out mundane explanations for problems before taking that leap and saying that this is a spiritual issue, meaning possession, oppression, infestation. 
Seth's mother was finally referred to Adam Blay, but at first she couldn't bring herself to make the call. I wanted to contact Adam, but something was telling me not to, that everything was okay, it was just in my mind. It's not, it's not really happening. And then things started getting a lot worse. I'd be here by myself during the day and I would see a black shadow walking around in front of me. Like, it was there, I reported it. And I did catch it on tape and I showed my mom and my boyfriend. I didn't think I was crazy anymore. The video shocks me. I, I've never actually witnessed something that, like that. You could notice like a figure in it, but it wasn't a person. It wasn't anything that you could see anywhere around it. It was just a shadow of something. With documentary proof in her hands, Elizabeth contacted Adam. But the night before he came, a small statue of an angel came flying off the wall. It nearly hit Penny and broke Elizabeth's mobile phone. People can be choked. People can be slammed against the floor, thrown down the stairs, dressers slid across the room, scratched, bitten, assaulted in other ways. I don't know how to explain it. I just know that whatever it was, it did not want to leave. Adam sensed absence on that first visit, but the exorcism ritual can only be performed by a trained priest. So Adam simply blessed the home paying special attention to Seth's bedroom. Went there, uh, did a house blessing, said some other prayers. So that we may defeat the evil that resides. Everything stopped. Seth had been out of the house during the blessing. But when he returned, his reaction seemed to confirm that something had changed. He was apprehensive at the door, looked around, seemed to realize something, got happy, ran to his room, looked in his room, looked around, went and jumped on his bed and, and started jumping up and down and laughing and we, it was a very beautiful thing to see. My son went right to Adam and climbed up in his arms and gave him a hug. That's impossible for my son. He's autistic. He did not go to anybody he didn't know. It's almost like he knew Adam was there to save him. Adam still visits occasionally to check on Seth's progress. And I'm sorry that he had to go through that, I really am. But it was short term and hopefully it's long forgotten now for him and hopefully it had no lasting impact. Given your experience with all this, what are your thoughts about ghost hunting now? Do you do it anymore? I don't do it now. We haven't done anything with it. Um, it's too risky. I think we nipped it in the bud this time and I'm praying that, that the grandmother, you know, makes a final decision about not playing around with inviting spirits home. Many people make a fundamental mistake. They think that they can open the door to evil, take a look at it, tickle its tummy, close the door, put it back on the shelf, and never have to worry about it again. The devil will not show himself to be an angel of darkness. Rather, he'll always show himself to be a good spirit, an angel of light, a good spirit guide, for example, so to speak. The most frightening aspect uh, of all of this is the lack of the real powerlessness that all of us have over these things as atomized human beings, as individuals. We're up against something that is really, really, really big.